So I uh, want to first off give everybody a sense of what Gulf Islands National Seashore is like. Uh, Gulf Islands National Seashore is one of 428 units managed by the National Park Service. Uh, every state, every territory, as well as the, uh, as well as the District of Columbia, uh, they all have at least one type of national park. Uh, there are some two dozen unique designations uh, that exist within the national park system. Those de designations include places like national parks. Uh, you might think of Yellowstone or Grand Canyon National Parks. Uh, but there's also national monuments, national military parks, national historical sites. Uh, there are national lakeshores, national military parks. There's a lot of those different designations. There are 10 national seashores in the United States. Uh, the creation of national seashores really became a, a thing uh, in the, the wake of World War II. Uh, with uh, service members returning to the states, uh, starting families, and with the economy prospering uh, and households having the means and the luxury to go on vacations, a lot of people were traveling to the Atlantic coast, the Pacific coast, and the Gulf coast. Uh, and with that, coastal development began to explode. And with that, public spaces, public access to the sea began to dwindle. Uh, here locally, Gulf Islands National Seashore was born because of the locals advocating for setting aside spaces out on like Santa Rosa Island so that they and future generations would have the ability to go out and enjoy the white sandy beaches and the emerald waters and the abundance of wildlife and those historic places that exist there too. Uh, so uh, here we are in 2024, um, about 52 years after Gulf Islands National Seashore was created, created in 1971. So it is more or less a younger national park. Uh, but uh, in 2023, Gulf Islands ranked as the fifth most visited national park unit in the United States. What that means is as many people are more or less, coming here to West Florida, the Pensacola area, as what are going to, say, Yellowstone or Acadia National Park in Maine. Of the 10 national seashores that do exist, Gulf Islands is the largest. It stretches about 160 miles from near Fort Walton Beach to the east of us, all the way to Cat Island, which sits very near New Orleans. Uh, Congress, within the congressionally drawn boundaries of the National Seashore, there are over 139,000 acres. That's a lot of acres. But of that, some 82% is actually marine habitat. So Gulf Islands is definitely, as the name would imply, a water park with boundaries extending, uh, in many instances, up to a mile out into the Gulf of Mexico. And depending on where you're at, uh, if you're in Choctahatchee Bay or San Rosa Sound, uh, Pensacola Bay or Mississippi Sound, those boundaries extend uh, certain um, yardages, uh, distances um, to different points. Um, all of this is to say that Gulf Islands is a water park without water slides and wave pools and lazy rivers. <laughs> Although you are all familiar with the Gulf of Mexico, it can on some days be very flat uh, to look like a lazy river. Gulf Islands has one of the finest collections, probably one of the largest collections of military coast defenses with some 20 uh, tactical structures uh, dating from the 1790s all the way through World War II. And then it has a unique distinction, a more recent unique distinction. Today, Gulf Islands has a total of six underground railroad sites that are uh, federally listed as underground railroad sites. And as far as I can tell, Gulf Islands has the most underground railroad sites of any national park in the United States. Two of those federally uh, designated underground railroad sites are in our Mississippi district, and then four are in the Florida district. Here, 
around our community. Uh, let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. So this is going to help you visualize Gulf Islands National Seashore. Uh, I've come to see Gulf Islands almost like a, a big city with really unique neighborhoods, if you will, uh, that all come together uh, to uh, create that unique community of places and things. Uh, so here we see our Mississippi district. Um, we do have a visitor center uh, in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, uh, at what we call the Davis Bayou area. Uh, it's a very popular uh, front country camping area, uh, as well as uh, providing opportunities for uh, gaining boat access to Davis Bayou or Mississippi Sound, uh, an abundance of fishing opportunities. But there's also uh, a string of barrier islands that range 9 to 13 miles out into the Gulf of Mexico. Here we see Cat Island on the far west, and then um, on the east end you have uh, Petty Boy Island. And then here we have in the middle of this image uh, the state of uh, I'm sorry, Alabama. Um, Gulf Islands does not have any um, property in that area, uh, just Mississippi, and then of course Florida. Let's go ahead and advance one to the next slide. All right, so. Gulf Islands has six smaller units scattered around the greater Pensacola area. Uh, if you've ever heard of Johnson Beach, that is a part of the national park here at Gulf Islands. Uh, Rosamond Johnson Beach is a day use site in what we call the Perdido Key area. It runs from uh, the Johnson Beach Pavilion Complex uh, east to Pensacola Pass. On Naval Air Station Pensacola, the national park here at Gulf Islands has about 64 acres with three historic structures that constitute the Fort Barrancas area. In the city of Gulf Breeze, we have the Naval Live Oaks area. Uh, the first experimental tree farm in the United States uh, is there. On the far eastern end of Santa Rosa Island, uh, fronting Choctahatchee Bay near Fort Walton Beach, we have the Okaloosa area. Sandwiched between Navarre Beach and Pensacola Beach, we have the Santa Rosa area with Opal Beach uh, being sort of the popular go-to location. And then occupying the far western end of Santa Rosa Island is uh, probably the, the flagship site of Gulf Islands, Fort Pickens, Fort Pickens area. So Gulf Islands is a large place. Uh, it's separated by state lines, highways, uh, county lines, city lines, waterways. Um, it is a, a wide-ranging, complex, and very dynamic national park. And it's in your backyard. All right, let's go ahead and advance one. So I'm here today, uh, this morning, to talk about the Underground Railroad. And if you're a little uh, confused as to how that even is possible. I mean, we're here on uh, the Gulf Coast in Florida, uh, which um, would, during the American Civil War, become a Confederate state and uh, fight for uh, the preservation of human property, of chattel slavery. But for as long as the institution of slavery has existed, there has always been resistance to enslavement. And I want you to, to pocket that little bit of information because I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, the Underground Railroad history in the 1850s and during the Civil War years. Uh, and I don't want anybody to leave thinking that the Underground Railroad only existed within that narrow window. Uh, resistance to slavery uh, spans time and place. But the National Park Service uh, defines the Underground Railroad simply as the resistance to enslavement through escape and flight. And so over the past four or so years, I've been able to document uh, numerous accounts of enslaved people on their own or sometimes with allies, the support of allies, who resisted their enslavement through escape and flight. And through those accounts, I was able to work towards having uh, places within the park federally designated as underground railroad sites. And it is this history, the history of the Underground Railroad in Pensacola, that I believe to be one of the best kept secrets 
in the United States. And by coming here before you today, that's given me the opportunity to share one of those best kept secrets. All right, let's go ahead and jump forward one. Uh, so I was only, a, as a representative of the National Park Service, I was only able to nominate places uh, that are managed by uh, Gulf Islands National Seashore for inclusion in a uh, program called the Network to Freedom Program. Uh, it's a program administered by the National Park Service. It works to uh, it works with uh, pu public and private individuals and organizations to promote underground railroad history. Uh, so, if you say, uh, for example, if you lived in a a, a house, you, your private residence, if you had uh, verifiable, credible uh, evidence that your house was a part of the Underground Railroad, you could nominate your house for inclusion as um, a, a stop or a station, if you will, uh, on the Underground Railroad with the Network of Freedom program. Uh, so I worked um, to nominate different sites within Gulf Islands for inclusion in that program. And one of the sites uh, is Pensacola Pass. And we're going to kind of jump through these sites in chronological order, not the order in which I had them nominated. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump. Well, actually, I lied. Let's stop here for a moment. Let me um, make this um, uh, point here. I, uh, Pensacola Pass, as a body of water, is a body of water in motion. Uh, it is, over time, has been moving westward. It's been migrating because Santa Rosa Island itself is a landmass that is crawling east to west. Uh, and it's crawling westward because of natural forces. Uh, Significantly, uh, the longshore current, which comes up from the southeast, from South Florida, and it hits that island uh, at an angle, causing sands on the east end of the island to erode and accrete here on the western end. Uh, in fact, there's this super highway of sorts out in the Gulf of Mexico called the Littoral Drift Zone, and that's where sediment is constantly in motion, moving east to west. And that's in part why the island is always changing. Every moment, uh, waves and currents and winds are re-sculpting that island. And that forces the shipping channel to move west as well. Now, human activity has sort of interrupted those natural processes, especially in the, the, the form of dredging activities to maintain the Pensacola Pass as a shipping channel. So it doesn't move uh, like it once did because of human uh, activity intervention. Uh, but what I had nominated uh, for inclusion as a part of an Underground Railroad transportation route was Pensacola Pass as it existed in the mid-19th century, not where it is today. The Pensacola Pass of the mid-19th century is actually within the Fort Pickens area of Gulf Islands. To go and visit that pass, you're actually walking on the island. All right. All right, let's go ahead and fast forward one slide. So I was able to nominate the 19th century location of Pensacola Pass uh, in part by working with the University of West Florida um, Archaeology Institute. They were able to show me where the shorelines existed uh, dating back to the 1700s. And it was with their, uh, their work that I was able to show um, evidence of where those shores uh, and boundaries existed. And, um, and then I was able to find stories of individuals we today call freedom seekers, enslaved people who pursued freedom on their own or with the assistance of allies. And uh, an individual that I refer to as Portsmouth Adam is one such example. In 1850, Adam was an enslaved man. He was 21 years old. He was the property of a local teacher who rented Adam out to the U.S. Navy to labor as a blacksmith in the Pensacola Navy Yard. And this was a rather common use for enslaved property here in the Pensacola area. Uh, when we think of slavery, at least in those antebellum years here in the United States, we usually envision enslaved people uh, laboring, toiling on cotton plantations. 
uh, in rice fields, on sugarcane plantations. But here in the Pensacola area in West Florida, those types of operations, agricultural operations, didn't exist. Rather, here in West Florida, you had industry in the form of sawmills and brickyards and the building and maintenance of a sprawling military complex in the form of the Pensacola Navy Yard and a string of brick forts, Pickens and Barrancas just being two examples. And because of that uh, industry that existed here, Pensacola, West Florida, had uh, what is today called industrialized enslavement, where enslaved people like Adam were rented out by uh, individual enslavers or companies to uh, private businesses or to the federal government uh, to provide labor and sustain the local economy. So Adam, in 1850, was 21 years old, uh, enslaved as a uh, blacksmith, rented out to the U.S. Navy to labor in the, the Pensacola Navy Yard. Uh, not content with being considered uh, a human commodity, in the summer of 1850, he began his pursuit for freedom. Uh, he snuck aboard a ship, a, a merchant ship, out in the bay called the Mary Pharaoh. Uh, likely, the Mary Pharaoh was crewed by um, individuals who were sympathetic towards his condition and were able to allow for him to come aboard and hide away in the ship's cargo. The Mary Pharaoh then traveled south across Pensacola Bay through Pensacola Pass and out into the Gulf of Mexico, and it um, continued on its long journey across the Gulf up the Atlantic, going to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Just a few days into that journey, though, the uh, officer in charge of the Mary Pharaoh discovered that a stowaway was aboard the ship. Uh, and that officer immediately um, set about to punish this stowaway through an arca archaic form of punishment called a keel hauling, in which uh, a rope would be tied around an individual's ankle. They would be thrown over the side of the ship and dragged underneath the hull of the ship so that they would experience a near drowning, but also their body, their flesh, would scrape along the side of the hull, which would have had a growth of... Um, uh, barnacles uh, would have been a horrific experience. But the crew intervened. They were able to protect Adam for the remainder of the voyage. It's unknown exactly why the Mary Pharaoh didn't return to Pensacola to hand Adam back over to the enslaver or local authorities. It's also unknown why they didn't take other opportunities to go into other southern slaveholding ports. Instead, the Mary Pharaoh continued on its way to Portsmouth. When the Mary, Mary Pharaoh entered Portsmouth Harbor, by that time, word had already reached the community that an enslaved man named Adam was aboard the ship. And so you can find newspaper accounts from that period announcing Adam's arrival. This is, by the way, the Underground Railroad. Uh, that term dates to the early 1840s. Uh, it was referred to as underground because uh, the flight of enslaved people, the aiding of enslaved people in pursuit of freedom, that was illegal, hence the term underground. Railroad stems from the fact that railroads were becoming a, um, a growing means of transportation. All right, so when we say Underground Railroad, uh, we don't literally mean an Underground Railroad. All right? So Adam arrives in Portsmouth Harbor. Local allies, uh, agents on that community's um, Underground Railroad uh, network, they began to try to intervene on Adam's behalf. A couple of abolitionists, they rode out to the Mary Pharaoh uh, to work to get Adam aboard their rowboat and to shore and protect him and ensure his freedom. Meanwhile, the um, officer of the Mary Pharaoh, they went to shore to try to find a local authority who could detain 
Adam and return him to slavery. Uh, there was a scuffle of sorts uh, where the officer of the Mary Pharaoh uh, would physically intervene to try to hold on to Adam because of the wealth that he represented. But ultimately, Adam was able to get into the rowboat with those abolitionists who took him ashore. In Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Adam was not safe. Adam wasn't necessarily free. Though New Hampshire was a free northern state, making its way through Congress and eventually signed into law in September of 1850, notice the date on this article, August 1850. One month later, the President of the United States signed into law the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act which would allow for uh, that teacher here, the enslaver, a JQ Guild, or hired agents, slave catchers, to go to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, seize Adam, and bring him back. So Adam had to continue his journey further north. He had to leave the United States, the land of the free, in order to secure freedom in Canada. And this is just one of the incredible accounts of one individual sailing to freedom on the Underground Railroad, beginning their journey here in Pensacola and ending it in Canada. All right, let's go ahead and advance one more. So Fort Pickens uh, would become a destination on the Underground Railroad, primarily during the American Civil War, uh, which ranged from 1861 through 1865. Uh, let's go ahead and advance one. Let's uh, get a, a better sense, though. Let's establish some context of what Pensacola was like in 1860 on the eve of the American Civil War. Uh, in 1860, Pensacola hosted a, a population, a white population, of about 1,700 people. There was a small free black community, a Creole community, of 130 individuals. And then Pensacola, the city, had an enslaved population of 957 people. One in three people living in the city of Pensacola was human property, property that could be bought, sold, traded, or rented out. Uh, in 1860, Pensacola, with a population of some 2,800 people, was the largest city in all of Florida. <laughs> Quite an accomplishment, right? Um, made in large part possible because of the institution of slavery, which brought uh, and sustained the economy here with the markets in uh, lumber and brick making. <clears throat> While impressive, there were 11 US cities in the United States more populous than all of Florida combined. So uh, that can be a little humbling statistic to share and to, to embrace. But what is impressive on Pensacola Bay, though it is um, a rather small community compared to other communities across the United States, it does host one federal or U.S. Navy yard in the, the form of the Pensacola Navy Yard. And by that point, it had three brand new uh, or new construction forts, I should say, uh, new construction forts, um, Fort Pickens, Fort McCray, and Fort Barrancas. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers was an enslaved labor force. They had been working on a fourth brick fort called Advanced Redoubt, uh, located about a half mile north of Fort Barrancas. Uh, but because of um, Congress's um, appropriations uh, laws or passings, uh, the uh, government didn't continue to fund the uh, Advanced Redoubt from 1845 through the start of the American Civil War in 61. Uh, so it was kind of just this construction site in progress by that point. But on Pensacola Bay in 1860, there was a sprawling Army-Navy complex here uh, with a Navy yard, three new construction brick forts, uh, and within those forts, over 360 type, different types of cannon, uh, over 17,000 different types of projectiles, and over 50,000 pounds of gunpowder. This is representing a huge investment in national defense 
And all of that would become very valuable if a war were to erupt. And it's because of the Navy, uh, Army-Navy complex here that Pensacola would gain a lot of attention from those who were eager and uh, would work to advocate for secession or the formal withdrawing of southern slaveholding states from the fold of the Union. As was common at that time, um, there were U.S. soldiers, Marines, and sailors present on Pensacola Bay. Uh, but their numbers were smaller. They represented a, a peacetime force. Uh, and as far as the Army went, uh, was concerned, they had um, a, a small company, Company G of the 1st U.S. Artillery, uh, numbering about 50 or so soldiers here on Pensacola Bay, uh, occupying um, a post very near Fort Barrancas. Let's go ahead and advance one. Uh, in command of that small company was a young lieutenant named Adam Slemmer. Uh, Adam was born in Pennsylvania, educated at West Point. He graduated in 1850 uh, before spending different time, um, time at different posts uh, across the United States, including some time in the slaveholding South. It was Lieutenant Slemmer who, in January of 1861, um, after gaining reports, rumors of armed militia seizing federal property in Alabama, he decided to move his command from Fort Barrancas to Fort Pickens, where he thought he could put space between him and his antagonist, the armed militia from Alabama and Florida, but also have support from the U.S. Navy to the south in the Gulf of Mexico. In Fort Pickens, Adam is going to hold on to the fort with his uh, combined force of 80, uh, 50 uh, soldiers and about 30 sailors. Um, and it's at Fort Pickens that he refuses to surrender the fort to Florida representatives. Uh, fort Pickens will be one of four in the United States that are retained by the U.S. military throughout the entirety of the Civil War. But his uh, presence inside Fort Pickens is going to create um, a challenge for him on March 12th, uh, 1861. Uh, in that, on that day, um, something remarkable would happen. And he would write about it later in an official report. Um, but on the 12th, Adam wrote, on the morning of the 12th of March instant, four freedom seekers uh, came to the fort entertaining the idea that we were placed here to protect them and grant them their freedom. I did what I could to teach them the contrary. So on March 12th, uh, this timing is notable, I think, because it is exactly one month before the first shots of the Civil War were fired, uh, which came in April of 1861 at Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, but it also comes just eight days after Abraham Lincoln was sworn in as President of the United States. So it's eight days after the inauguration of Lincoln that four freedom seekers suddenly appeared outside Fort Pickens, entertaining the idea that U.S. soldiers in blue uniforms there would protect them and give them freedom. This is the first documented instance in which enslaved individuals voluntarily entered U.S. military lines in what became the Civil War. I think that's incredible because this is happening here in Pensacola, Florida, not in places like Virginia or closer to the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Lieutenant Slemmer is going to return those freedom seekers to Pensacola. He hands them over to the city marshal here. He does this personally. I think uh, in his uh, attempt to convey um, sincerity to his Confederate enemy. He is involved in a military standoff on March 12th. I think Slemmer wants to play nice with his Confederate counterpart. Does not want to antagonize them. Uh, two, it could also be that Slemmer hadn't yet received any direction from the War Department on what to do 
in terms of enslaved people entering U.S. lines. And the War Department may not have any guidance on that front because Abraham Lincoln has been in the White House for just days. And he had uh, campaigned to restrict the expansion of slavery into westward, uh, western territories and not to interfere with it in states where it already existed. And so this is all just happening within days of Lincoln's presidency. But it's to create issues for people out in the field like Lieutenant Slemmer. Uh, so Lieutenant Slemmer returned those four freedom seekers to the city marshal here in Pensacola. When he returned to Fort Pickens that evening, four more freedom seekers were there waiting for him. They too would be returned to slavery. Though those eight freedom seekers failed to seize and realize their freedom, uh, again, they became the very first documented freedom seekers to voluntarily enter U.S. military lines in what would become the American Civil War. Um, in certain newspapers, Lieutenant Slemmer was criticized. A uh, word of this event would uh, spread far and wide. Uh, it would reach abolitionists up in Massachusetts. It would even cross the Atlantic, where a notable uh, British uh, abolitionist would criticize Lieutenant Slemmer for returning those freedom seekers to slavery. Uh, it would um, be rumored, though, that those freedom seekers began their journey in Milton, Florida. Uh, that journey would have been one of over 40 miles through forests, through swamps, would have required that they cross open water. Again, the Bob Sykes toll bridge isn't there, right? Um, they either had to swim across those uh, open bodies of water or use a small skiff to get across. And even if they reached Fort Pickens and the U.S. forces there, they would not have known whether or not they would be accepted or rejected. In the 1850s, at least, U.S. Uh, soldiers, uh, Marines, and sailors, they would actually play an active role in seizing yeah. enslaved fugitives and returning them to slavery. We don't know the names. We don't know the identities of those eight freedom seekers. That information has been lost to time. But we know that they had to have been incredibly brave in order to even enter into that journey. Uh, earlier, you were talking about um, one of the ideas you had talked in your devotions was the idea of hope. They had incredible hope for freedom and going south to freedom, going south to Fort Pickens. All right, let's go ahead and advance one. With the start of the Civil War in April of 1861, uh, U.S. reinforcements were landed at Fort Pickens uh, the night of April 12 and the morning of April 13. Uh, while that is happening, Confederates are bombarding U.S. forces in Fort Sumter at Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, Lieutenant Slemmer was replaced. He was going to be sent away with his command to recover up in New York, where he and his men were hailed as heroes, some of the first of the um, Civil War for the, uh, the Union. Uh, and he was replaced by Colonel Harvey Brown, um, a long uh, army, uh, career army officer uh, in his early 60s when he takes command of uh, Fort Pickens and the newly constituted District of Florida. Uh, but two, Harvey is going to uh, experience a similar uh, situation as Lieutenant Slemmer. Though those eight freedom seekers that uh, had been rejected by Slemmer, others are going to pursue freedom at Fort Pickens into the summer of 1861. Uh, they were entering Colonel Brown's lines individually and in pairs, creating a humanitarian crisis for the colonel because he has to think about clothing, and feeding and sheltering essentially these civilians entering his lines. And he, as a career army officer, he's going to want direction from his superiors. And so it's on June 22nd that he wrote a very short message to the War Department, but a message that I think is kind of poetic. We don't know a lot about this individual, um, 
as far as his uh, politics would have been concerned or his personal feelings towards slavery. But we can get a sense in his message to the War Department. He wrote, I shall not send the freedom seekers back as I will never be voluntarily instrumental in returning a poor wretch to slavery. But, and I think this is where the army officer in him comes out, but will hold them subject to orders. It's letters like this that are pouring into the War Department from Army and off, uh, Navy officers across the newly constituted Confederate States of America. Um, the War Department is going to put pressure on Congress and the White House to provide direction. And eventually that's going to happen. Because of letters like this from Colonel Brown, uh, Abraham Lincoln called for Congress to meet in a special session, uh, which opened on Independence Day 1861, just days after this letter. The sole purpose for this special session is for Congress to uh, take action on enslaved individuals entering U.S. military lines. What comes of this special session is what is known as the First Confiscation Act. It's going to give officers like Colonel Brown the, the legal tools to allow for freedom seekers who reach his lines to stay there. Uh, the First Confiscation Act would uh, stipulate uh, that any enslaved, purpose, uh, enslaved person used for military purposes in support of the Confederate war effort could be offered freedom or protection if they were to enter U.S. lines. And so that's going to be Colonel Brown's stance. Uh, this is going to deprive the Confederacy, uh, the Confederate war effort, of valuable labor, um, but it's also going to provide officers like Colonel Brown with intelligence. Because those enslaved individuals entering his lines, they know what conditions are like behind Confederate lines. They know the armament. They know numbers. They can feed this valuable information to individuals like Colonel Brown. Right, let's go ahead and jump forward. Um, Enslaved uh, individuals, freedom seekers, are also going to be able to provide valuable labor to the U.S. war effort. Uh, and one of the stories that we have here that unfolds on Pensacola Bay in the summer of 1861 is the story of Peter Dyson and Henrietta. Uh, in 1861, Peter Dyson was in his early 30s. Uh, he was an enslaved man, of course. Uh, and he was the human property of an individual named Jasper Strong. Jasper Strong, in 1860 here in Pensacola, was a big name. In fact, he was the single largest enslaver of any individual here in this area, enslaving 200 men, women, and children. Jasper Strong, too, uh, had been the contractor to the Army Corps of Engineers. It was Strong, with his enslaved labor force, who oversaw the building of Fort Pickens, Fort McRae, Fort Barrancas, and the start of Advanced Redoubt. With Jasper Strong's permission, because it was not permissible under Florida law, but with the enslaver's permission, Peter Dyson was allowed to marry Henrietta, who in turn received the permission of her enslaver. In 1861, Henrietta, too, was in her early uh, 30s. Uh, she was hired out as a domestic. Uh, she labored in the summer of 1861 in a local boarding house. Her enslaver was a, a merchant here named Oliver Jenkins, who in 1860 enslaved nine individuals. Uh, with his permission, Henrietta was allowed to wed, um, allowed to marry Peter. One day, though, in the summer of 1861, over a trivial matter, the merchant, the enslaver, Oliver Jenkins, violently and brutally beat Henrietta. In an act of what I think is resistance, and two on her part bravery, she ran away. She fled into the, the piney woods just northeast of the city here, possibly going as far as the mouth of the Escambia River. And there, in that forest of refuge, 
she would eventually be discovered by Peter. There in the woods, they had a decision to make. They could return to their enslavers and be physically punished for their acts, or they could take a chance and sail south on the Underground Railroad to Fort Pickens. Uh, Peter had a couple of motivations uh, to pursue freedom. Um, in an interview with a correspondent in uh, October of 1861, uh, Peter was recorded as having said um, he had heard his master say that in case of an attack by the federal forces, meaning Colonel Brown's forces, uh, the slaves were to be put in front of the rebel batteries, uh, these sand defenses that protected large cannon, uh, with arms in their hands, meaning muskets, uh, and in case they refused, they were to be shot down by the rebels themselves. So under this threat, Peter had some concern, naturally. <laughs> but two, he had his wife Henrietta to think about. Uh, go ahead and click one more. In the forest of refuge near the Escambia River, uh, Peter would find Henrietta. And in a, a similar interview with a newspaper correspondent, uh, we can learn that at last Peter told her that if she would go over to the fort, meaning Fort Pickens, she would receive protection. She was afraid to return to her mistress, as she was sure to be beaten again. And she said, well, let us go. Under cover of darkness, the couple launched a small skiff into Escambia Bay. Uh, because of a storm, though, they had to put back to shore, but would renew their attempt for freedom a few nights later and sail some 15 miles south over Escambia and then Pensacola Bay and eventually made it to Santa Rosa Island, where a couple days later they entered Colonel Brown's lines. Colonel Brown would allow for them to stay. He would promise them wages. Uh, Peter working as a bricklayer on Fort Pickens, and Henrietta uh, working as a cook and laundress for the garrison of troops there. Uh, this image is not depicting Peter, Dyson, and Henrietta's journey on the Underground Railroad, uh, but this is a good depiction of what, in some instances, the Underground Railroad looked like here in Florida. Uh, this is a sketch that was drawn by a U.S. Navy officer aboard a ship called the Kingfisher, which was off the coast of St. Mark's, Florida in 1862. It was a part of the, uh, the uh, naval blockade of southern ports. Uh, one morning, that Navy officer looked over the side of the ship and saw a small skiff with some six to eight freedom seekers making their way towards him. Uh, that image would be sent off to the editors of uh, Harper's Weekly, uh, one of the most widely read publications at the time. And so this is a good representation, again, of what the Underground Railroad would look like here in our area. And I think it captures the, the spirit of Peter Dyson and Henrietta's story perfectly, which is why I like to use it. Uh, Peter Dyson and Henrietta uh, lived and worked out at Fort Pickens from uh, the summer months of 1861 through late October 1861. Uh, at that time, they were placed aboard a steamship called the McClellan and sent up to New York City, where they would try to forge new lives in a nearly, uh, nearly free nation. All right, let's go ahead and advance. The Confederacy evacuated the Pensacola area in the spring of 1862, uh, largely because of battlefield defeats up in uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and over in New Orleans. Uh, that Confederate army of 8,000 men here could be more uh, better used elsewhere. And so it's in uh, May of 1862 that the arm, U.S. Army and Navy forces, they re-entered Pensacola, and they reoccupied the Barrancas Army Post and the Pensacola Navy Yard, and would do so for the remainder of the Civil War, effectively controlling West Florida for the remainder of that war through 1865. Uh, but with the U.S. military presence here on uh, the mainland, freedom seekers didn't necessarily have to cross, um, enter into a dangerous un uh, crossing of Pensacola Bay or Santa Rosa Sound to reach Fort Pickens. Instead, they could try to reach the Barrancas Post. 
Let's go ahead and advance one. Uh, in November of 1864, a Hungarian immigrant uh, named Alexander Asboth, uh, who um, gave his services to the U.S. military in 1861, uh, he would rise to the rank of Brigadier General by the time he comes here to West Florida to take command of all U.S. forces in this region. Uh, he arrives, though, in uh, November of, I'm sorry, I said 1864. He arrives in November of 1863. And uh, he goes around and he wants to assess his, his lines, his defenses. He wants to get a, a good understanding of the situation here with his uh, force, but also his enemy, that Confederate force. And while he's out um, trying to get his, his arms around everything, uh, in a, an official report written on December 5, he wrote to his superior officer in New Orleans that several contrabands, uh, that was the popular term for enslaved individuals entering U.S. lines at the time, uh, several contrabands who succeeded in reaching our lines were added to the 14th Regiment Corps d'Afric. One of them came in with a heavy iron bar on his leg, wandering with it three weeks through woods and swamps. Around the time that uh, General Ag Asbo uh, took command here in the Pensacola area, uh, a all-black regiment arrived. And this would have been a pretty new type of regiment to arrive here during the Civil War. It was an all-black regiment led by white officers. Uh, it was smaller than what um, the U.S. Army typically allowed. Uh, typically, the U.S. Army called for one infantry regiment to number some 1,000 men. But because of racial prejudice, uh, it was thought that black soldiers didn't have the same intellectual capacity as white soldiers. And so the units were, um, at a point, made smaller so that white officers could teach them more quickly and have a, a better span of control in terms of ratio goes. Uh, so the 14th Regiment would have originally been about 500 soldiers. Uh, they were organized at Port Hudson in Louisiana. Uh, in a few months' time, though, uh, in the spring of 1864, they would be redesignated the 86 United States Colored Troops. But again, the 14th Regiment, Corps d'Afrique, they would be the very first all-black regiment to be stationed here in Pensacola during the Civil War. Um, for a while, while I was doing this research, this was one of the only accounts that I had that confirmed that enslaved individuals, freedom seekers, were reaching Barranca, the Barranca's Popes. Uh, but uh, with a little bit more research, just continuing to dig around, I was able to make an incredible discovery. I was able to identify who the man in the iron bar was. Let's go ahead and advance one more. I got kind of lucky. I found a newspaper account uh, written by somebody, an anonymous individual, at Barrancas, uh, in December of 1863. It coincided with the same time as General Alexander Asbo's report to his boss in New Orleans. Um, in an article printed in the Green Mountain Freeman, a Vermont uh, anti-slavery newspaper, uh, an anonymous writer wrote about the arrival of that individual in the Iron Bar. It noted that the individual, that their name was Henry, and that they would enlist in the 14th Regiment Corps d'Afrique. Uh, it went into great detail about Henry's journey to freedom. Uh, in 1863, Henry was an enslaved man, about 30 years old, he was enslaved on the uh, plantation of a James and Mary Burnett in South Central Alabama, a cotton plantation. Uh, Henry would pursue freedom for the first time in the summer of 1863. For additional context, 1863 is when the American Civil War took a drastic turn and would take on new meaning. Earlier that year, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation took effect. It declared that all enslaved individuals located in states then in rebellion to forever be free. It also allowed, officially, for the U.S. Army and Navy to begin recruiting free and enslaved black men into the armed forces. That's how the 14th Regiment, in part, came to be. 
Uh, and so in the summer of 1863, the year of the emancipation, Henry was making his way south from the Burnett Plantation. He made it to Pensacola, <coughs> which at that time was largely uh, uh, desolate. Uh, it was a no man's land where much of the civilian population had departed many months earlier. Because of the number of empty homes, Henry found one and lived in one for a couple of weeks. But one morning, he woke up and he was surrounded by Confederate troopers, cavalrymen. One of those troopers had a gun pointed at Henry. The Confederates took him, marched him back up to Pollard, Alabama, where they paused, and ripped the clapboards off the side of a building and then used those clapboards to beat Henry for having tried to seize his freedom. And then those Confederate troopers took Henry and gave him back to the Burnets. To punish Henry for trying to pursue freedom, Mary Burnett ordered that a tire be removed from a wagon, a wagon wheel, and fashioned into a torture device, which was a common practice in the Southern slaveholding South for individuals who, enslaved individuals who fled from plantations. Uh, in this case, the uh, iron tire was fashioned into a metal bar, 18 inches in length, tightly riveted around his right ankle so that the iron bar extended below his right foot and then <laughs> bent upwards to form a hook of sorts so that he would have to drag it anywhere he went around the Burnett plantation. It would retard his movement uh, so to speak, and really prevent him from ever trying to gain his freedom again. Uh, in addition to that, wearing that torture device, he was forced to split rails on the Burnett plantation as well. None of this, though, would stop him from trying to gain freedom again. He remained hopeful. Henry would enter into his second attempt for freedom in mid-November 1863. Right, that's around the same time that the 14th Regiment arrives in Pensacola, around the same time that Alexander Asboth arrives to take command. It's also around the same time that Abraham Lincoln left Washington, D.C., which was Lincoln's first departure from the city during the American Civil War. Lincoln uh, boarded a train in November of 1863 and traveled to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where a major three-day battle had been fought earlier that year in July. Lincoln had been invited to Gettysburg, though, to deliver a few appropriate remarks to dedicate a new National Soldier Cemetery. That's where Lincoln would go on to deliver his famed Gettysburg Address and share his vision for a new birth of freedom here in the United States. While Lincoln was sharing his vision for a new free and equal nation, uh, Henry was literally fighting for his freedom by traveling again southward to Pensacola. Uh, he would use rags to try to lift that iron bar on his journey, which, as, uh, as both wrote, lasted about three weeks. It required that Henry travel a distance of some 100 miles through forests, through swamps, while dodging Confederate soldiers and slave patrols. Uh, there was also a near drowning experience that he had because of the weight of that metal bar. Uh, eventually, though, Henry successfully reached U.S. lines at Barrancas. Uh, he would have to swim across Bayou Grande, and then he suddenly appeared and found allies who would take him in and help remove that bar. Uh, and as that anonymous writer wrote, he said, By the lantern light, I observed that a piece 18 inches long of a large wagon tire was riveted around the freedom seeker's right ankle so tightly that it could not turn but must stand out towards the right. That event was so shocking to this anonymous writer that they captured it in pretty great detail and then shared it with the editor of a prominent anti-slavery newspaper up in Vermont. So I had General Asbo's uh, official report of the arrival of the man in the iron bar. I then had uh, this newspaper account. But I wanted to know Henry's last name. I wanted to know a little bit more. And so that's where I was able to turn to military records 
to flesh out even more detail. So if we go one more, oh, it's not there. Go back. Oh, I'm sorry, I know where it's at. Yeah, go back. I apologize. Uh, what we see here, this image, is Henry's uh, enlistment paper, his enlistment form. Um, it identifies Henry Stalbert having been born in Sparta County, Alabama, 30 years old. Uh, these military enlistment forms, they didn't ask about an individual's legal status, uh, meaning uh, free or enslaved. It typically just asks for occupation, and that's where we see labor written. Um, he volunteered the 5th of December, 1863, the same day that Asboth wrote his report to uh, his superior in New Orleans. And then here we see uh, Henry Stalbert's name signed. But because it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read and write in the slaveholding South, and it was illegal to learn how to read and write, that's not actually Henry's signature. What is, though, is the X in between his first and last name. And so with all of this documentation, I was able to piece together this freedom seeker's story. But he was not content with being a freedom seeker. He would become a freedom fighter. He would enlist in the U.S. Army and serve in the U.S. Colored Troops through the remainder of the Civil War. All right, let's go ahead and advance one. Uh, Santa Rosa Island was another site that I had designated, uh, that I applied to have designated. Um, and while the island itself in its entirety uh, in 1864 became this corridor for freedom seekers, I only nominated the areas that Gulf Islands manages, which include Okaloosa area on Choctahatchee Bay, uh, Santa Rosa area between Navarre Beach and Pensacola Beach, and then the Fort Pickens area. All right. So, uh, but it was actually the entire island, some 42 miles long at the time, that became that corridor for freedom in 1864. Let's go ahead and advance one. Uh, in September of 1864, uh, General Asboth is still here in command of federal forces in West Florida. Uh, he uh, entered into an expedition uh, with 700 mounted soldiers. Uh, with wagons and the support of a steamship, and he wanted to ride um, into Florida's Jackson County, uh, where uh, he believed he had received reports that Confederate supplies were being stored, prisoners were being held. He wanted to go and uh, capture as much and disrupt as much as he could um, in support of military operations that year, that fall. Uh, and so uh, this Mariana Expedition, as it's known, culminated on September 27, 1864, in the Battle of Mariana. And on the return trip, Alexander Asboth had something additional to consider. Because as his expeditionary forces rode eastward towards Mariana and then on their return trip, they became a magnet for enslaved individuals who would want to pursue freedom. They would latch on to his force. Uh, but Asboth was uh, wounded in the Battle of Mariana, and because of that, he was placed on that steamship and uh, sailed back to Pensacola Bay to recover. Uh, but when he got back on October 1st, he wrote that some 600 contrabands, meaning freedom seekers, followed us with the greatest enthusiasm. Santa Rosa Island would serve as their bridge from slavery to freedom. Have you guys ever been out to Santa Rosa Island? You've walked on the beaches. Uh, you know how hot, how humid it can be out there, how harsh and brutal that environment can be. These 600 enslaved men, women, and children, they had to walk the entirety of that island to reach Pensacola Bay, to reach Fort Pickens, and eventually... For Barrancas. Uh, such was their commitment to the ideas of the nation of freedom and equality. Let's go ahead and advance one. There is strong evidence to suggest that uh, Charlie Crosby here was one of those freedom seekers who followed Asbo's command with great enthusiasm. Uh, Charlie was an enslaved man in 1864. Uh, he was an enslaved man in Mariana County. Uh, he enlisted in the U.S. Army at Barrancas 
In October of 1864, when Asbo's command returned, uh, he would serve in the 86 U.S. Color Troops, the same regiment as Henry Stalber, and survive his service. Uh, he would eventually move westward. He became a cowboy uh, and then saw a pension in 1914 in which he had to meet with a pension agent um, to verify some details about his service. And in that interview, he said that I was not free at the time of my enlistment. I ran away and enlisted. No, sir, they did not examine me much. Just asked me my age and I told them I was 18, but I was not that old. I told them that because I wanted to get into the army. Because in the army, he could ensure his freedom and possibly fight to liberate other men, women, and children held as enslaved individuals. Um, and so it's because of the timing of his enlistment and where he had been enslaved that uh, there's very strong evidence that he was one of those freedom seekers. Let's advance one more. Uh, some freedom seekers were very young. Uh, Armstrong Purdy was one of them. Uh, he was eight years old in 1864, but in his late 20s, possibly 18, uh, early 30s, in 1931, um, I'm sorry, this image is of him in his late 20s, early 30s, but he would have been much older in 1931 when he recounted the Mariana battle. Uh, he wrote um, long after that a Yankee white soldier said to me, boy, does he want to go? I said to him, yes, sir. He moved one of his feet out of his stirrup and said, put your feet in there, which I did. At the same time, he reached for my hand and pulled me up on the horse and placed me behind him and placed my hands about him and said, hold on, do not fall off, because he was going to be riding his way to freedom. Uh, Armstrong Purdy would reach Fort Pickens. Uh, he was temporarily separated from his family, but he would be reunited with his father and returned to Mariana County, I'm sorry, Jackson County. And uh, there he would actually go on to become the county's very first black attorney. His descendants still live in the Jackson County area. Uh, and in fact, just a couple of years ago, his daughter, his daughter passed away. And his story is carried on um, in large part uh, thanks to his, um, his grandchildren who still live there as well. So you could go on one more slide. Again, the history of the Underground Railroad at Gulf Islands National Seashore and in the Pensacola area is truly one of the best kept secrets in United States history. Uh, these stories for too long disappeared in large part from our collective memory of the Civil War, of our nation's ongoing struggle uh, in interpreting and defining for present and future generations what freedom means. Uh, when we go to Fort Pickens or to Fort Barrancos, um, we can explore these complex and powerful and emotional stories, uh, not necessarily to gain insight as to where we can go, but to gain insight into ourselves here today. For anybody who wants to learn more, you can visit our park website. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Underground Railroad um, and other sites listed with it, you can visit the Network to Freedom website online. They maintain a large database. I think there's now some 800 or so, maybe more, uh, sites included on the Network to Freedom, and they span the entirety of the United States. So this is just the start, I hope, of your new uh, journey into more of this history. Again, I appreciate Dick and the uh, Brotherhood for having me. Uh, did anybody have any questions, though, about any uh, of the stories I was able to share, uh, or even just uh, questions about the park? Uh, yeah. Have you been able to interview any of the, the, uh, the family at uh, the present time uh, who related to some of these people? No. Um, one of the, the regrets that I do have, a lot of this came about um, because of the COVID pandemic. Um, with uh, 
uh, with everything shutting down in uh, March of 2020, uh, the park closed and we were uh, told not to report. And so I was working from home uh, and I spent a lot of my time teleworking, researching and writing what would amount to basically a book. Um, and that's where some of these stories come to you today. But it, it, when I was working on this project, we were all isolating. <laughs> and so for that reason, uh, I was never able to get into the community to explore further what oral traditions still exist here. Um, so that's work that needs to be done. Yeah, somebody uh, else, I think, is going to have to pick up that torch and carry it forward. Yeah. You finish those interviews and you can submit that for your doctoral thesis. You're right, yeah, <laughs> precisely. Yeah. There is an African historical society mm -hmm. in place here in Pensacola. Yeah. And they do have meetings and programs. Yeah. And I'm sure you. Yeah, I, I, I've had contact with them. I've met with uh, Dr. Cheryl Howard, who plays a big role with the, um, the society itself. I mean, in fact, it was Dr. Cheryl Howard who who shared with me um, a memory she had of, I think it was her parents or grandparents, who talked about uh, going uh, down the island. Um, that was a story that per, uh, persisted in her family's oral tradition about enslaved people pursuing freedom. Um, but um, this was just a conversation that we had. It wasn't a formal sit-down well, oral. Capturing those memories. Very much so. Down. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a wonderful book that I just read uh -huh. on this subject okay. called Husband, Wife, Master, Slave. And oh, I it's think written that. by a man named Wu. It's about a slave woman who was half white uh -huh. who dressed herself up as a rich white person yeah. and took her black husband as her personal slave. Yeah. And they left her plantation in Macon, Georgia, right. and made it all the way to Boston where they were not accepted. Right. They ended up in England. It was fascinating. Yeah, that's uh, the story of um, William, the, their last name was Kraft, uh, and she could pass off as white. It, it's one of the prominent Underground Railroad stories that persists. Um, it's better, one of the better known, and it's just because it's amazing uh, that they would disguise themselves as a, a free white woman with her um, enslaved manservant, um, and actually ride a train uh, to freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did Fort McBray play any role in the underground? Uh, there's no evidence so far to suggest that it did. Uh, Fort McRae was seized by state militia and eventually held by Confederate troops uh, starting in January 1861. Um, in November of 1861, there was an intense two-day bombardment here on Pensacola Bay in which really the U.S. Navy would lay into Fort McRae, uh, and that's in large part why the fort would um, begin yeah. to just crumble. Yeah. Um, and even when the Confederacy evacuated this area, the U.S. Army did not reoccupy or repair Fort McRae. Um, the brick fort would just be allowed to sort of disappear over time. But there is an account. Um, it unfolded um, around the same time as the story of Peter Dyson and Henrietta. Uh, there's an enslaved woman uh, named Olive Kelly uh, who began her journey on the Underground Railroad on Perdido Bay. Uh, with the assistance of two uh, anonymous white individuals, uh, they sailed uh, down Perdido Bay and what likely would have been um, across uh, Big Lagoon where a U.S. Uh, warship, I think it was the USS Colorado, would intercept them, bring them aboard, and then take them on to uh, Fort Pickens. Um, so that's so, uh, so far the only account that I've been able to find that would come within reach of Fort McRae or Perdido Bay. Um, but I want to circle back to the topic of books. Um, if you're interested in learning more, a wonderful book that was published in 2017 um, by a professor and historian named Matthew J. Claven. Um, he published a book uh, by uh, the Harvard University Press uh, called Aiming for Pensacola. Um, it uh, explores Underground Railroad history, not just in the mid-19th century, but it goes back to uh, the early territorial years, and I think even into some of the colonial years. 
Um, he used to teach here, I think, at Pensacola State College, but now he teaches somewhere in Houston. So that's a wonderful book. Uh, Gateway to Freedom by Eric Foner is also a wonderful book. It offers, um, he looks more so at the corridor from Philadelphia to Boston and New York City um, and the Underground Railroad up in that area, but it gives you a really good idea of um, just how expansive the Underground Railroad was. Um, so I like that book a lot as well. So just a couple of uh, recommendations. Um, both, I'm sure, are available here at the public library. Yeah. Any others? Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you so much oh, for being with us. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.